thank you again for coming today, joining the This Is How I Teach session. This is the second session that we host this semester. And starting this week, we're going to have a bi-weekly session. We'll have five faculty present this semester. And then we hope to see you here every time. And we serve great food. Um, today, we're very thrilled to have Dr. Mel Woods coming here to present his experience teaching online. And he is well known about developing a really um, clear learning objectives for his online courses and then using that as a guide to design the learning activities and also the uh, course delivery. So I am really looking forward to hearing about his experience, and let's give him a round of applause to get started. Thank you. Um, so what I'll be talking about today are using learning objectives to help design a course, to help design the syllabi, and to make sure that everything we ask people to do in an online course fits together. So it's some of my experience before I get to you know where I'm coming from is uh, my first online class I taught was the summer of 13 and then I taught it again in spring of 14 and then two more classes in summer of 14. So I've had the four, uh, two different classes that I prepared, four different sections then over that time and I'm currently developing a third class that I'll be uh, teaching again in the summer. So that's just my experience, and some of you may have more experience online than me teaching. So this is just kind of the lessons I've learned and what's been helpful in my own experience. And as I talk, please feel welcome to stop and ask questions. I might be dancing around something you've thought of or that you're interested in talking about, but I won't get to it exactly. So please feel welcome to raise a hand or just shout out. We can go in a direction that is more helpful to you necessarily than exactly maybe what I was uh, thinking of going into. So the outline of what I think I'm going to say today, where I think we're going to go, first is uh, I want to just have a dis brief discussion on why learning objectives of all the places you could start to design a course, of all the ways we do start in reality in designing a course, why start with learning objectives? And then from there, um, kind of lead into a discussion of what are those other options, and if you want to talk about pros and cons and have any discussion there, we can about the other options. Then I'll get into some of how I've applied using learning objectives in my own uh, online course, in my online design and teaching. Uh, I'll give you some examples both of how they've impacted the way I design my syllabi to help students as well as how they design my, uh, affect my design of the Blackboard course. I use Blackboard for my online delivery. Um, and within that, how they've even impacted things I've chosen not to do that I know are recommended in a lot of online teaching um, literature, but there are some things that I've chose not to because they didn't align exactly with my learning objectives. And uh, we'll have some discussion there. And then finally, along the way, really, I'll talk about some of the results. I'll try to give you some feedback I've got from students, give an indication, um, not just from students, but also from my own experience, what I found to be helpful and how it's helped me in managing my own time and in managing the course. So, to start with, you know, why learning objectives? The first thing that came to my mind as I started to learn more about being in academia um, and teaching was this realization that we all have accrediting bodies. Some of us have multiple accrediting bodies. And every time that I've looked into one, every time I have someone talk to me about accreditation, one key question is always, well, what are you teaching people? What are your learning objectives? What are your, what's your assessment plan? How are you assessing learning? And so the more I started to hear and understand why this was important and why we do it, um, I started to look in more to learning objectives. And that eventually led into me teaching. But I know that that's not the way that everyone operates in setting up and designing a class, is necessarily start with that. The, for instance, the way I began teaching um, several years ago was, you know, I was given a syllabus and it had some learning objectives from the person who taught the class before me. And I said, okay, well, those are my objectives. Now how am I gonna teach? And the two kind of, they worked in the same document, they worked in the same class, but I mentally wasn't connecting them necessarily, right? They were, they, but they were there. So this is one reason why you might start with learning objectives. You know, we have to, to answer to them. We should be assessing these. Our accrediting bodies speak of them as best practice. So that's one option, uh, one reason why we might start there. Another one, think about, is just uh, your own opinion. We have. We're all faculty, we're all in charge of teaching our classes, so to what extent does, it, does an individual 
accept and buy into what accrediting bodies tell us of learning objectives um, on a really personal level, not just what we do as part of our jobs in our annual reporting. But you know, like I said, I taught for years where I found it very important, where I knew it was important, but I didn't take time out to really change my own opinion. Um, do any of you have strong opinions about learning objectives in your classes, pro con, do you know faculty who have strong opinions about how deeply embedded they are in the course and guiding what you do? Okay, are there any stories before I go on to share mine that you would like to highlight that we could all kind of know, um, have as a shared experience in the discussion today, either pro or con? Or, okay. We'll move on. That, not requiring you to speak. That's right. That's why you get the food and, and I don't right now. So that's, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's a prerogative. You don't have to. Yeah, I'll, I'll share, share yeah. a story. It's not uh, necessarily about using learning objectives to design your course or not. Um, but we, this summer, we were in a service learning working group, if you will, working mm -hmm. on uh, assessing learning objectives. And I... I've never given assessment much thought, and you know, when I have thought about it, I've always thought, wow, this is just extra work. Is it really necessary? But through doing that work with you this summer and with the whole group, I started to appreciate how um, you can use assessment as an additional way of really seeing if your course is, is meeting the learning objective. So, right, we're teachers because we want kids to learn or whatever, young adults to learn. Yeah. Um, and using assessment to really measure that, an additional way of measuring it, and then being able to showcase what you're genuinely accomplishing in your, in your course. Yeah, and, that, and, and that is a good point that this really does tie into assessment. The, my discussion today is not necessarily connected and based on assessment. But that's why the, a lot of the accrediting bodies look at this, and this is, I know we have to report that. Um, and one of the things I showed in the accrediting was the, our Core 39. If we're going to have a course in Core 39, one of the first things you have to do is say what your learning objectives are. And then, of course, talk, show how you're going to assess that and prove that you're reaching that. Um, and so it is. And so assessment is one very good reason it, it, that we should be focusing on this. And then what I want to do is talk about how, I, beyond assessment, how else it helps. In today's discussion, another reason to look at learning objectives is you know we're designing our courses, we're putting a class online for people, and they're paying to take this to get credits for a degree, but also hopefully to get something out of it. That we they may not all want the same thing out of the course. They may not all be, and I'll show you some comments later. They may not all enter a course as passionate about the subject as you are, especially if you're teaching a required course which is one of mine that every business student has to take, whether they like marketing or not. Um, but they, they would like, you know, most of them are going to have some expectation of what they should get out of it. And I found that as I highlight more of the learning objectives I'm setting, and they become more clear of exactly what, they, what I'm telling them they're going to get out of it, it tends to work better throughout the semester. And uh, I want to highlight that through the discussion. But, and, and I'll highlight that this is really why I've stuck with it. Um, as I'm designing a class, I'm doing it because I want someone to get something out of it. I want someone to learn something, so why not start there? Well, why not start there? I will tell you why. <laughs> because there are lots of other things. Right? Yes, please, tell me why. Why start there? Of all, like I said, I taught for years and was getting good reviews not starting there. So why change? I can tell you it created more work. Once I started to change the way I looked at designing classes, I had to redesign my classes, which took time. Um, and it wasn't necessarily going to bump a lot of my reviews or numbers. So, but again, it was the internal motivation to focus on, on those learning objectives. For instance, we can start lots of places. This is a, from a video, a snapshot of a video on our own distance ed shop here. You know, we can start with all the activities we do. Yeah, okay, so in the classroom, we had a book, we had certain meetings, they had some papers they did. Now online, where well, I could add a discussion board, uh, I could set some goals in an online calendar. And you can start there and think, well, what activities are we gonna do? What are the components I'm gonna add into class? That makes sense. The first time I, I started teaching online, I opened up Blackboard and they have all the tabs there, right? Assignments, content, the discussion board, groups. Okay, well, I'm just gonna have all that because it's already there. And that's one way you could start. Um, another way we could start is with the syllabus. Right? We all have syllabi. If, you, if this isn't your first semester teaching, it's in the syllabus. We're all pretty good at say, telling people this. So if I'm going to teach a new class, well, I take the syllabus I had when I was teaching it face-to-face. -face, 
and I take out the classroom and I put in Blackboard or whatever online system. I take away the times and I just put due dates in there and all of a sudden it's an online course, right? That's the same stuff, just a different mode of delivery. I record my lectures maybe. Um, we could look at it that way and I, that was part of the way I approached this the first time I taught. We could also look at this and we have checklists that say, first off, you know, propose it, start with an existing syllabus, submit that, and then again, those activities. What are your content? What are you going to use for recording? What quizzes and exams are you going to use? How are they going to be administered? And you can look at this very, you can start off as a puzzle, and we're going to put everything together. Where the puzzle, though, all the pieces are given. Groups, pages are given, the textbook's given, the quizzes are given, and what you're going to do is put them together in a way that makes sense. And it's really easy with textbooks who say here are 13 chapters. All you have to do is follow, start at chapter 1, go to chapter 13, and use those tests, use those group discussions, and you will have taught something, right? And that's not wrong. I'm not here to say that's wrong. It's a way to start. All of these are ways to begin organizing and delivering an online class without starting with learning objectives. They can just be a part of the puzzle. They don't have to be the foundation. And I know because that's not the way I started. Um, and it wasn't the way I started even in face-to-face. -face, which is why some people choose to stay traditional. I've been doing this for years traditionally. And have any of you seen the paper? I'm assuming everyone's seen the paper chase and that the picture is not losing its effect. Okay. So um, my dad was also a professor. So I grew up in, with academic movies. This was kind of part of my nature growing up. So this was a very natural place to go. But we can stay there. You know, you don't have to teach online until, you know, or you might go begrudgingly into online. Well, I'm still, I'm going to teach for another 10, 15 years and everything's going online. Someone told me to. That's another way to look at it. Um, so we have these options. And now what I want to move into is, for what it's worth, here's how I teach online. Um, and here's what I've done. I'll show you some examples of the way it's worked out for me. Uh, how it's kind of progressed over time, and hopefully some of it will, will be useful for you. First, how I started was piecemeal. I had my puzzle. I had a former syllabus from someone else who was teaching online, um, who's in the audience with us today, but kind enough to say, here's how I've done it before. This might work for you. And so I took the syllabus of someone else who had done it online. I took my syllabus that I had done in the classroom, and I thought, okay, so what, what do I do? I, I cut out the parts that talk about the classroom, and I paste in the parts about online, and I've got an online class. And then I, I was fortunate enough in this class to have an online textbook. So I said, okay, wait, so now I've got the textbook, and they already have some activities designed, so I'll sprinkle in some of those. And then I had Blackboard was there, and I said, okay, and it's, I know it's difficult to see from where you are, but my first page was not a start here, welcome. My first page was still the default Blackboard first page, and they had to find exactly where to go to get started. But, you know, I put my content there. It wasn't necessarily organized in any way other than how I thought about it. But it was there. And honestly, that, that first class, the way I organized it, I said, all your slides are in the slide tab. All your videos are in the video tab. All your notes are in the notes tab, your tests are in the test tab, your this is in the that tab. I designed it the way I would a class. There's your textbook, here are my notes, come to class for lectures, I'll tell you when the tests are. It made sense to me until I got feedback from students who said, I don't know where to go. <laughs> Why is everything so disorganized? And that was odd because I had never got that in the classroom. I'd be getting, oh, I love your class, it's very entertaining, I, uh, your notes are very helpful. I never thought, but I was always there to tell them three days a week or two days a week for 50 minutes or an hour and 15 where to go. Never had to thought that I had to tell them on day one exactly where to go to figure this out and make it easy. So, piecemeal was fine, but I started getting these kinds of comments. Some assignments were due then at five, some at, they even thought the traditional midnight because most of the assignments were due at midnight, so that became traditional for them. Right? I wasn't there to explain the logic behind it, so they started to just interpret what was traditional. It gets confusing. Uh, having content in multiple areas, like I just described, and having to jump back and forth for them was confusing. So that was an indication maybe I need to reassess where I'm going. Um, they did like the self-paced. I do a self-paced when I go online. I don't say you have to be here from 5 to 6 to take test 1, and then from 5 to 6 the next week to take test 2. I set it up and say your learning objectives 
for the first three weeks are A and B. Here are the materials, they're all organized for you. Meet these learning objectives and I'm going to assess your achievement based on this assignment that's due in two weeks. And do it whenever you want. If you can learn all that in two days, you learn it in two days. If you can learn all that in two weeks, but the point is now I started setting up, I kept some of the free-flowing self-paced, um, especially some of the non-traditionals like that. The students who were already busy, they were taking online not as a substitute necessarily, but because it really did fit their schedule, they, they did appreciate some of that flexibility. So I tried to maintain that. So I started with the Start Here page. Not only did I add the Start Here page as, as it generally advised, but I started with this question. What should someone get from this class? And so the next time I went to teach, the next summer, I was teaching that same class of principles of marketing, which all business majors have to take. I was also teaching a, that's a 300 level class. I was also teaching a 400 level required class for marketing majors. So a different set of people. And it was marketing research. So a class you could imagine, uh, I'm sure, actually, you probably all think of marketing students as loving research and math, and that's why they take marketing. But unfortunately, a lot of them like the creativity part, and they don't really look forward to the research class. And um, this is the first time we had offered it online. And so, that, but again, I said, well, let's start with what they should know. Let's just, and what I found in transferring that class was some of the things that I wanted them to know in face-to-face, -face, I didn't know how to help them learn it online. There were some learning objectives, okay, that I've ha had to reassess. Not a lot. I, I think there were only, there was one or two that I had to reassess this first time around and think, okay, I got to approach it in a different way. You know, um, because when you start with learning objectives, when I do, I think if I'm going to put a learning objective out there, I've got to have an assignment. I like formative assignments as well. I got to give them something to do to learn it. I've got to give a way to assess whether or not they're learning it. And so this is where I started. I didn't start with a textbook in mind, didn't start with anything else. I started now with what should students know. And I'll give you some examples of how I struggled and how I've worked with that. This is from my Marketing 305 class. I boiled it down to three objectives and content. There's also a skill objective based on ethical decision making. But just as an example, I'll focus on these three objectives. This is where I started. Now, in class, I had originally had these as multiple Con this originally took like a whole page of my syllabus. You're going to learn like 50 things. And I said, but really, what are they really going to learn that I can tell them and show them without, tell without being physically with them that they're learning it? Okay. And I got to really, there's some basic marketing concepts and vocabulary. In my previous syllabus, I had spelled out each one of them. Now what I did is I said, this is what you have to know is concepts and vocabulary. And then in each module, I outlined what those concepts were. They weren't the initial learning objectives, but the thing was you had to know vocabulary and concepts. And then as they became ready, piece by piece, I would present, here are the 15 or here are the 10 you're learning now. Focus on this for two weeks. This is part of the learning objective one. Another one that I wanted to do was relate those constructs to consumers and organizations' behavior. And so now I had to start to think what kind of, um, and initially, and as soon as I think of the objectives, now I'm thinking, well, what assignments are going to go? And then after I think of what assignments I'm going to give them now, and I'm also thinking, well, what tools can I give them to learn the material? Notice how it's slightly different now the way I'm thinking about it. It's not, I've got a textbook, I've got a syllabus, I've got a discussion board, I've got Blackboard, how am I going to put together? It's, I want them to achieve putting, relating concepts to behavior. Now, where do I go? Is that going to be a discussion board? Is that going to be a group? Is it going to be a textbook? Is it a video? We, all those pieces now come second. And finally, I wanted to wait for them to put it all together, some general schematic. Now, that wasn't in the textbook. What I wanted to do is have a way to put it together, and the textbook did a good job talking about it in Chapter 16, but I wanted them to know it up front and then remind them of it throughout each part of the class. So I found a separate external uh, tool that could help me do it to where I could place it in each module as they went along. Uh, but again, this is thinking, what should they know? What should they get to? Now, here's how it starts to look on the syllabus. I have those objectives in mind. The next thing I do is I go and I think, well, okay, if these are the, the objectives, what are the activities they're going to do? So I think, okay, I'm going to have the content objective. I can do really well with some multiple choice tests. I could have done um, 
case studies. I could have done lots of other things, given them projects. For me, the multiple choice exams were a, a realistic way to say, are you able to understand the basic concepts? So I had five multiple choice exams, and I even on the syllabus let them know, this is objective one. Objective one, here's what you have to do to meet that. And then in this, I go down and say objective two, where you had to relate those concepts to behavior. I say, you have two assignments. A concept assignment, which for me, I, they had to take a picture of marketing in action. They could take it with their phone. They could go online and find a picture. They had to take a picture of some type of behavior, be it from a firm or from a person. And then they had to paste the picture, identify the concept it represented, and say how. I, I, I never did that in face-to-face. -face because I would just bring examples to class. This was me, in the way this started in class. So, someone give me an example of the, how you make a decision to buy something. Well, I can't do that online. <laughs> so what I had to do was, okay, look, here's a list of 20 concepts. Go find an example, paste it on Blackboard, and tell me why that example fits the concept. Okay, and that was one of the assignments now. It becomes an assignment because I have to make sure they're able to do that. And that was just a way to do it. Another way, this is something from the textbook that the textbook online site provided were some homework assignments. I make sure videos and drag and drop things where now I could say, okay, I could pick out assignments, not as busy work, not as just to say I do them, but I made sure they were things that were connecting concepts to behavior. So it was much more on videos and on decision making. They weren't just review of vocabulary. They were specifically chosen to connect to that. And then finally, they have a final paper. Why do they have a final paper? Not because someone told me I have to have a final paper, not because it was in the syllabus before me. We have a final paper because I have an objective that says, can you put everything together in an overall schematic of marketing strategy? Final paper was a reasonable way to do it. So I have this outlined on the syllabus, and then I have to reinforce it so that they know what they're learning, so they know what they're getting out of it. So now on the syllabus, I have to summarize, okay, yes, this has modules, and in each module, I have the topics that you're gonna learn, that was part of objective number one. I have the textbook chapters, now I'm outlining the resources they have, kind of going in more detail, outlining it again by that basic overall objective, and then after I explain how the modules fit, I can very easily say here's how the assignments in each module fit. So I'm walking them through, I'm saying, here are the objectives, you gotta know these three things. These three things are all gonna have these six or seven assignments. Those seven assignments are all gonna be part of these four modules. And here's how it all maps. In module one, you've got one assignment for objective one. In module two, you've got two assignments related to objective two. And they're able to see that now why I'm asking them to do things. It's not, and, and it, do, now, I can be realistic enough to say I don't believe that every one of them are internalizing the why. Okay, but I know from feedback that some students are. Some people are recognizing, they're able to recognize why I'm asking them to do things. Some, you know, are less involved and that's just, you know, if you have a different levels of involvement, they're going to have different levels of processing. And from the comment where a student said, I don't like having things due at five in the traditional midnight, some other changes, I now have all assignments due at the same time not because I think it's better, but because necessarily other than it's easier to understand. And if something is not due at the traditional time, quote unquote, it is now in red, orange, purple, some other color to kind of highlight so that then I can pull my shirt up and say it's in the syllabus. But you know, it was always in the syllabus. The point was they didn't actually recognize it as being there, but I had to kind of get better at organizing. And again, this is a four week class, so this is a very tight schedule. But I do the same in a traditional semester long class. Okay, it's still module based, certain assignments and objectives are grouped together, and I try to make it meaningful. Um, so that was in one class. That's a required class at a 300 level, not a 400 level class. Where it's not, you know, in a principal's class, an intro class, you have lots of things. And, and so to say that my learning objectives are 13 chapters that are unrelated, it gets very difficult for a student, I think, to understand for me to understand as a teacher. For the students may get it great. For me, it's difficult to think about. First is, you have to know all the concepts. Now, in a 400 level class that's more specific, just on research, so this whole class was one chapter of that previous intro, intro class, much more specific. Here, I don't have three objectives, I have 10. 
These are marketing majors, they're seniors. They should be able to do certain things at the end of this class. And a lot more of this is not just understand, but describe, explain, differentiate, <coughs> identify, write. A lot more actions. This is a lot less about knowing and a lot more about doing. And, I have, and I'm still uncomfortable, I'm, I will say, with the amount of, object, of, of objectives. I'm still thinking I should reduce this. And here's why, though. The reason why I think I should reduce the number of objectives is because once I started taught, teaching this online, I realized, especially in a four-week period, it's very difficult to make sure that the students have the time not just to do the work for each objective, but to have enough time to reflect and internalize it. I think they're all valuable. But can I help them internalize it? And then I have a decision to make. Do I take away one objective to put more emphasis on another? Or do I keep some of them maybe less stressed or less part of what I'm teaching? And that's a tough decision. You don't want to, you don't want to say anything they don't have to know. I don't. You know? But how much depth can I get in that topic is something I have to think about. So I'm still struggling with that. But it's because I know I start here. You know, I'm not starting with 13 weeks, four weeks. I'm starting with what I want them to learn. But again, I'm able to say on the syllabus again, these are the learning objectives. For each one of these objectives now, here are the assessment tools some, um, or assignments that you're going to have, and they know how they relate. Here again, I have a summative final assignment, this assignment five in this class, that, that captures most of this. But I, I walk them through different assignments, letting them know how it fits. And then again, I always have the exam schedule up for them, but I use the modules when I teach online to say in this module, this is the content you're learning. This content relates to these objectives. These are the assignments that are going to let us know how well you're doing or the formative assignments, formative assessments. They're going to let you learn as you go and give them the due dates. But I always have this as part of every syllabus now. The objectives as clearly stated as I can along with the assignments that specifically address those, those objectives and which modules those objectives and assignments are couched in. It also helps me know that then when I develop my Blackboard site and I go to class module one, what do I need to put in there? Which chapters belong? And by thinking of it this way, I went from, and I now have transferred this, something I learned online into my face-to-face -face class. I went from a textbook that had 13 chapters down to a textbook that has, it's the same textbook, but I talked to the publisher and said, you know what, I can, I can reach my objectives by only using eight of these chapters. Now, the, now, the, now we can put it online. Some odd things started to occur that I learned. One, the textbook publisher didn't publish that book online. But when I said I only want eight chapters, they said, oh, we can put that online. Well, there's another benefit. Now I've got an online textbook that I couldn't offer before. Students have a reduced price. They can still, and since it's the same book, I can tell them where the chapters are from. They can still buy it used somewhere, or they can go to the bookstore. But I can say, look, there are these only these eight chapters. I, I still can teach you what was in those other five, but you don't have to read the chapter to get them. Notice I start with that learning objective, and I didn't start with the textbook. Now I only choose what's in the textbook to help me meet those objectives that I can't meet some other way. If I can give you a video, an exercise, an assignment, if I can find it from somewhere else online, I'm going to do that, right? Um, so that was kind of a, a, another um, externality of this. So really, this is very interesting, isn't it? I remember saying at the beginning, you know, we can just interact. I don't have to talk the whole time, and then I've talked the whole time. So, um, you know, are any of you doing the same things, but you just never thought about it as leading with objectives? Are some of you, do you, are you already outlining your syllabi this way, or are you leading with objectives also and doing it in a different way that we could share and kind of work together on? This is my approach to it. And some of this might sound different, but not be different. You might be doing the same thing. Like I said, I'm new to this. I, I anticipate a lot of people doing this and just not putting it in the way, same wording I do. So actually, I do similar stuff. Uh, I teach uh, discrete mathematics, mm -hmm. and uh, I find that the the publisher every year they change, reshuffle the content a little bit. So sometimes, some, sometimes the, the arrangement does not make sense at all. So I kind of like uh, 
use my way, I think, for example, I want to teach logics. So this will be the chapter sometimes go back to the very end of the book. So I, 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 I reorganize the whole book uh, sections uh, to meet the objectives. That is so, I'm so glad you brought that up because I forgot to say something that was right here in black and white staring us all in the face. Um, a class assignment one deals with objectives five and six. I got to tell you, before I did this class, this was a research class, but like a, a, so there's the math. But I had this, these two objectives that it was a, a talking about using web analytics. And my textbook doesn't talk about web analytics. Okay, it's more based on much more traditional research methods. And I thought, but I can't give them a class and not have them learn how we're doing research online. So I've got to inter integrate this. So I created an assignment and some helpful links to help them think about it. Um, and it created two objectives that relate to it. But I thought, you know, every other assignment builds on itself. All the other objectives build on themselves. These two just happen to stay on their own. And I put it as assignment one, and it was very awkward for me. I, thankfully, none of the students said anything. But it was very awkward for me so, typing out my online instruction saying, so objective, so um, assignment one has nothing to do with anything else. <laughs> um, but it's important, and I give you two weeks to do it. But, you know, it's finding a way to explain that this is stuff that's, you know, not necessarily chronological, but everything else is. And why do I name it assignment one, but it's due after assignment two? I'm still working with some of those things. But knowing, but I'm able to explain it in a way because I can say, here's what you're supposed to learn. I don't focus so much on how odd it is that assignment one is due after assignment two. You have to learn these two things. Assignment one helps you. I think you make a good point on your line there, though, is that chronological books don't always make for logical sequencing, and I don't have to follow the chapter 1 through 13, because I don't. I shift chapters around all the time. And yeah. the other thing, too, you made a good point on, too, is that I think instructors fall into this trap of, we got to have 20, we got to have 20 activities, or they don't do it. Well, I mean, if it takes two activities for the whole course to get what they need to get out of it, why not? I hope you got that part on tape. Yeah, if it takes, if you can teach all your objectives with two activities, why not? You know, and, and that's the point. And uh, they're going back to the accrediting bodies and what do students get out of it? If we're here so that students are look, people, I'm a student too. It's always learning, but people. If we're here so that people learn something, and that's the main reason we're here is to help people learn something, then it. If we measure the process, sometimes we can get off track which is why I like to start with what they should learn and let the process thing come second. And if it's two activities or, or if it takes five, um, we get there. And then on the Blackboard side, it breaks down like this. Now, if you remember, I mentioned earlier the first time I taught online, I took the design Blackboard site from old Blackboard and I just kept their tabs and I designed it the same way I would face to face and I just said, here is everything. We're going to do this the way you would have done it. Well, then, as I redesigned based on objectives, I said, now I have, and took advice from our distance learning services and said, okay, I'm going to have the start here page with everything outlined. But then I have class modules that, and in each class module, remember, it's stated on the syllabus. In class module one, these are the three or four things you're supposed to learn. Here are the videos and slides that help you learn it and the activities that both help you learn and help me assess if you're learning. So that's what's in the module. And then in class module two, we're going to move on to something else. Maybe it builds on part one, maybe it doesn't. It's going to be different for every class. But in module two, now here's a set of what you're learning and what you're doing. And then I started to notice, I try to stick to that design of the modules only being what you need to complete in that place and time. And I noticed in this class, though, that... I had anticipated, and it turned out to be true, there were other resources they needed that they may have needed them across different modules, or they may some students may have needed them, some may have not. So now I created additional resources. JMP is just a like SPSS or SAS or Excel. It's just another software to do analysis. So I said some students I knew had had it before in another prerequisite. Some students had never seen it. But I knew they could all access it for free from my USI. We have the license. So I created a folder that said, you know, if you need help, go there. If you don't need help, stay in your module. Because the assignments, that everything you need is in the module. But if you need extra help, there are videos and other things up to the side. And then the final assignment here is a, big, is a research report. And I thought, okay, they've got four weeks. 
And in class, I knew how many questions I had about this report. To have them do a full research report with the analysis and conclusions and the buildup. And so I thought, I'm going to create a folder just for that assignment. I did it in, again, the organization. I didn't want to muddy the waters of each module. The module, I'll show you now, has, each module has slides, each module has videos, it has assignments, it has a study guide and a test. And every module looks the same. So you know what you're getting. Now, because if, if you remember everything from the prerequisites when you come in, and if you're a very organized person, not like me, but I know they're out there, then this is all you need to do the assignments. But I thought, you know, in class, some students ask lots of questions about other things. In class, some students don't, took the prerequisite two years ago. And so I thought, rather than put, putting it in the module, let me just create that help resource that's separate. Because what I, what I believe is that a student, if I put it in the class module, when I design this way, they think they have to do it. And that's one other thing I want to mention. I have a class where um, I teach online. It's not this. Uh, it's this class and another one, actually. I have a test study guide. And my test study guide outlines topics for test one. Please note the pages correspond to required reading in a textbook. And I say nothing about the videos. I have learning objectives based on content. That content they can get by reading a book. They don't have to listen to my lecture to understand the content. So in all my online classes, I don't take test questions for my lecture videos. My lecture videos are there to help them understand and apply the, what they read. And the lecture videos are there to help them do other assignments. My multiple choice test exams are there to assess whether or not they understand the content which I believe at this age most of them can do by reading. Those who want the additional discussion of the topics, I have video. But I make it very clear to them that I'm not going to take one two-second line out of my video and put it on the test just to make sure you watch the video because the purpose is not to listen to Chad on a video. The purpose is to learn the content. What I have, though, all my other assignments are discussed in the videos. So now, if you read the instructions and expectations of the assignment and they don't make purpose, now the video is there to help. It's there for support. It's not there um, as, you know, now if I don't have a chapter on something or if I can't point you to a reading, then I'll have a video. And I'll say there will be test questions on this video if there's no alternative way. But I try to make that clear for, for people as they're working through the course. So you know the email percentage of your students actually watch the lecture video? It's uh, about 50%. Yeah, because that's pretty consistent from semester to semester. Yeah, and from class to class. What, they, what I find is that um, the ones who are just looking at this as taking the test and getting out, they read the book, they appreciate being told what to do, and they get out. But what happens, the lecture, my tests, based on those readings, are never more than about 30% of their final grade. So the students who want to do well in the assignments, the applied part of my classes, um, the ones who are watching the videos, do tend to do better um, be, be, because they're watching them and learning more about how to apply the material. And I get that. Um, I don't have a high drop uh, DWF rate, though. The students are able to get by. What I find is that that 50% it's an average. They watch the videos that are meaningful to them. So every video is not meaningful to every person. But because I don't have lots of people failing, I get a sense that they're watching the videos that are important. Um, they're just not watching every video. Every student's not watching every video. Uh, but I dare say that I gave some lectures yesterday in class that every student didn't necessarily listen to. to. <laughs> I know I gave the lecture, but I'm not sure if everyone listened to it. <laughs> they were there. You know, but it's interesting, too, that part of that could be learning styles. And since I do learning styles with all my classes, there are those students who learn much better reading. And we will all have a student in class who's staring out the window or just not focusing and nailing every exam because their learning style is learning from a written word, learning from studying alone. 
and they're doing great aces with that. Now here you're giving them, they come to class because they have to, right. but they're right. not really present. But if you ever call on them, they may ask you to repeat the question, but they know the answer. Yeah. It's just they're learn. They, you're like Charlie Brown, you know, wah, 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 wah. And it's not by any choice of theirs, it's just their ability to learn is that way. So here it's interesting where they have the option. So some, probably not all, but some of those students who aren't watching you, they don't need to watch you. In class, they don't get much, much from, not you, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, but from the lecture. It's the delivery yeah. method. And, and it's funny, um, I've even, I make a conscious effort when I make my videos, and I don't highlight this online because I, I try to promise them it's from the book. So they give them that certainty. And again, I think that, to me, that motivate, to me, it would be motivating to read the book if I know that I'm going to be tested on it, it if I can give that certainty. But also, um, when I make my videos, I have my test in front of me. So I make sure that at least 90% of my multiple choice tests are given examples of in the videos. Because again, that's what I think is important to learn. And that's what I'm going to ask them to apply in other assignments. So there is a connection there. But it is basically it, the learning style. Some students, they're not good. And I had one student and they, um, some confirmation for myself on this in a review at the end of the semester said, I appreciate not having to pick out parts of the video that would be on the test. So they were watching it. But they appreciate that confirmation that here's where the test questions come from. Um, and so now on these, and I'm going to, and I'm going to show you again how those videos work. I have some examples. I'm not going to play the video, but how I use the videos to help walk through students through assignments and application. Um, but first off, just on every assignment that I give, the assignment always starts now with the learning objective. So assignment, assignment, this is, you have three learning objectives that you're going to be working on in this assignment. This one, you have one, two, three, four learning objectives that are going to be part of this assignment. And so I start with that at the top. And as I design the assignment, it's with those learning objectives inside. And if I don't put something in the assignment that's not related to that, and I learn over time, I learn over time that, well, you know, that assignment that I loved, man, it wasn't doing the job. Because after I started doing this about two years ago, I had to change lots of assignments because I thought they were good but they really weren't directly connected to what I wanted the students to learn. And it wasn't intentionally. It's just I wasn't putting that objective first, so there were some cracks that I was finding in, in my work. And as I started to do this, now I can be very clear that this is why you're doing this assignment. This is what you're supposed to learn. And since I always have a cumulative assignment that has them tie everything together, I can get a sense as to how well they learned it at the end. But I give these pieces of assignments that all work together. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, in regards to your learning objectives, do you have course agreements within your disciplines as to what learning objectives are going to be uniform throughout the different sections, or are these your learning objectives? That's a very good point. Um, in our discipline, we do not have course agreements. That's something that we have discussed in some of our program meetings before. Some of my, one of my colleagues at least is here. We don't have that right now. Um, I think that is valuable. I think it's a good thing to do. What I've done here on my course objectives, there was a recent, in this class, the ones you see here, there was a tuning project that was done across three states that, you know someone who was part of that, mm -hmm. that was done across Illinois, Wisconsin, Missouri, Indiana. We had some faculty members that was part of it, just for marketing. They did it for other topics. It's been adopted, this tuning project that set learning objectives, it's been adopted in Japan and Australia. I've taken things from that project to make sure that there's some external validity to what I'm asking people to, to learn. Um, and in principles, uh, I just worked with my own experience. And I read other syllabi, and I picked sil objectives that tend to go together. But I know mo uh, in that 305, most syllabi have a lot more objectives than I do. But what I've done is condensed a lot down to that know the concepts because it helped me design my course. But since these are your learning objectives, how often do you go back and review them and see if they're still appropriate? I mean, new textbooks come out every few yeah. years. I'm assuming that would prompt you if nothing else would. But. So that's a good point. For instance, in the research class, the first time I started, the first class time I taught market research, I had nothing on online analytics and web analytics. But what I found then, looking at like the tuning project that was done, looking at textbooks that come out for review, plus my own experience, I do consulting, 
I do work with other organizations to keep in uh, tune with what people are actually applying day to day, going to our executive and residence discussions that we have in the college. I added that component of web analytics to the class as an objective. And what actually meant I had to reduce some things too. I couldn't just keep adding objectives, and that's the difficult part. It, it's relatively fun to think about what I should add, you know, what should I put into it. But what's hard is knowing that if I add something, well, I just filled up 13 weeks or 16 weeks last time with eight. Now I'm going to go to 10 is knowing what to, what to adjust. I find that to be the real difficult part. Um, and what I've done, for instance, in research is I've reduced, for instance, the amount of t-tests we run. Instead of going over three different types, we go over two. And that I allow me to add some other content in. So. That's a good question, and it's um, but it's just through consulting, through reading of literature, and through reviewing of the textbooks allows me to adjust the content as needed. Um, I think I personally believe it's best if we uh, when it's done as a group. Uh, I encourage a, a group of scholars coming together and trying to coordinate those because I think it also allows for consistency. But that's a different lecture on designing curriculum based on learning objectives. This is just <laughs> online classes based on learning objectives. Um, by my calculation, I've got um, four slides in four minutes, so we'll go fast here. But the, briefly, I just want to highlight, I told you before about research assignment help. This is a big paper they have at what they're expected to do, how they're graded is in the module. Extra help resources are in a different tab. And this is what I give them. I give a video lecture with using this as one slide that says, you know what? You had an assignment number two about the research process. You had assignment three about constructs and measures. Assignment four about measures and relationships. Now, guess what? In assignment five, you got to put it all together. Oh, and you remember that other assignment you had? It has nothing to do with this one. <laughs> but I kind of let them know visually. Okay, look, it's not all for naught. Uh, everything you've done up to now is designed to meet this key thing. Can you actually report what research is? I've taught you how to do it in these other objectives. Now, can you report it? And then I also let them know within that video and within these slides and say, look, remember in assignment four, you had to talk about do a t-test and interpret the results. Well, now in assignment five, you have to present a t-test and the results. And so I try to highlight even the, from the discussion, from the instructions, since my assignments tell you the objectives, and the objectives are followed by what you do, I can then show you, in assignment four, you did this to meet objective, whatever the number was. Now in assignment five, I told you from the beginning this is summative, so here's how it relates. And I did that for each one of the assignments. And that was a video that some watched, some didn't, but it allowed them, some, and by the way, some who didn't watch the video I know came and just spoke to me in my office or through email or called me on the phone. Um, so finally, some of the results I've got here from 2014. First, from 305, that introduction, the principles class. I did not have high expectations for this class. I don't enjoy marketing. <laughs> I did not enjoy the ideal of marketing as much, to be specific. So not really coming in with much, but the class and layout were perfect for my learning, again, learning styles, and it taught me useful information. And that's all I can ask for. If I've got 30 different students, all with different learning styles, and some of them think it helps their learning, and they find it useful, that's all I, I can ask for. This was for my research class then. Um, this was their first online course, so they were concerned about how easily it would be to understand the material. Right, how easily can I get through? Um, but the last comment here, they found it, that he, talking about me, was helpful and takes time to ensure materials and assignments are understood. Uh, even though I start with objectives, I still believe it's no substitute for actually encouraging online students to contact you. I do send out weekly updates and encourage students to send me an email. I send out in that weekly update and I say, hey, if you're not going to send me an email, stop by my office. If you're not going to stop by my office, give me a phone call. Um, just because we're online doesn't mean we can't talk. And some students like that. You know, some students, I never hear from them. It's okay. It's their, that's their prerogative. But I, I do encourage students to contact me. And um, you know, I don't do a personal introduction with my face. But I make sure through my words that they know I'm a real person. I'm not automated. Please come talk to me. Email me. I try to respond, you know, within 24 hours so they know it's not just someone who checks their email once a month. So that's all I got. So 
hopefully some of it was useful, some of it helps. Um, and I can share any of the materials that I use if you ever find, think they'd help, if you want to see an outline of a syllabus or anything. Yeah, thank you. This was very beneficial. Are your PowerPoint slides going to be available? Uh, Are they? Yes, yes. We will put the PowerPoint on our website. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay, so on the distance learning, distance learning website, we'll have. Okay. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a reader than I There you go. Yeah. I probably won't have 50% of the faculty who actually watch the video, I wouldn't think. You know, I wouldn't. I'm not a video type watcher. And I have, anyway, my time's up. Well, I have five minutes, but I like to end class early. It increases my minutes.